How many of us here have heard of the sinking of the Titanic ship? Anybody heard of that story before? And help me remind me, what was it that caused the sinking of the ship? An iceberg, right? An iceberg hits it. It goes down. It's a really sad story. Lots and lots of people die from it. Now, one of the most fascinating parts of the story to me, in my opinion, is that is that is the time from the that when the iceberg hits the ship, or I guess the ship hits the iceberg, whichever way you look at it, to the time when the passengers begin to actually realize that they're sinking and they're going to drown and die. Like, there seems to be, from all the different accounts and so forth, a, a good amount of time between when the iceberg hit and broke open the bottom of the ship to the time that the passengers as a whole realize what's happening and that they're going to go to their death. Uh, for instance, in, in one of the movies based on the events of, the, of that day, that night, um, uh, one time this uh, woman passenger comes out, she, she felt the shake of the ship as the iceberg hit it, and she comes out asking a crew member, like, why has the uh, engine stopped? To which he lies straight to her and says, don't worry about it, ma'am, uh, we just threw a, an engine propeller. Uh, later on, there was some, a couple passengers who... Uh, looked at each other, and they were, one of them said, hey, we, I heard something about an iceberg, you know, or something like that. And the other one said, well, I haven't seen it, so I think everything's fine. Uh, others, later on, there was a time when one passenger just looks at a crew member, could tell something was wrong, something was going on, and the crew member just says, don't worry about it, there's, there's no emergency. Uh, later on, actually, this is phenomenal. It's recorded that there were some passengers who went out to the deck of the ship and they found broken pieces of the iceberg on the, on the deck of the ship and they start throwing it like having a game and playing with it like you do a snowball fight. And what they don't realize is that multiple floors down underneath them is that people are literally drowning at that point in the bottom decks of the ship, but they're up there on the deck playing with the chunks of ice from the iceberg at the same time because they have no idea that it's occurred. And uh, later on, when they finally get the passengers up onto the deck, they put life jackets on them and so forth. Even then, for a while, everybody thought it was a false alarm, a drill. They were serving them drinks on trays. They had the musicians, live musicians playing and entertaining them. But here's the reality. In all of everything I've been saying, all this time, there is a sh the ship is going down. The iceberg has dealt a blow to the ship that will sink it, and everybody is going to die, and it's just a matter of time through all of that. Now, I know this is a pretty sobering way to start off a sermon, especially one on Easter Sunday, for, all, for goodness sake, right? Um, but see, there's just like there was a serious problem that night, that an iceberg hit that ship and it was going down. You see, there's an infinitely worse problem of something that has affected every one of us in this room today on Easter Sunday. And that's what I want to address. You see, I'm not going to be like one of those crew members and say, oh, there's no problem and just lie through my teeth. I'm not going to be like one of those crew members who says, okay, yeah, there's some, there's some things that aren't right. But you know what? Hey, let's just all gather together. Let's just sing a bunch of songs. I'm going to tell you how to have a great life, the best version of you that you can be. And just kind of like just everything's going to be all positive only. I'm not going to be like those crew members, you see. Instead, because I love you and I care about you. You know, some of you right now are like, wait, you haven't even met me yet. Well, I guarantee I still love you and I care about you. I just look forward to meeting you, maybe after service. But because I love you and I care about you, and because I love Jesus, and he has told me and every one of us that are Christians that one of our main roles in life is to lovingly warn everyone if there is a serious problem that's going to take our lives and finish us off in the future. And so I do this in love to warn us. Let me just say this, maybe if this is your first time and you heard about our church somehow, some way, you're thinking, this is already a weird thing. Is the church that meets in a school, what kind of church is that? And you're already leery, and now you're sitting here hearing about the sinking of a Titanic ship, and there's a big problem with us. Uh, let me just ask you this, though. 
Would you want to go to a church where if there is a serious problem for us, where they only just tell you positive things and never tell you the truth about the serious problem, how you can get it fixed? Or would you want to be told the truth even if it's hard to hear? And I like to think that all of us would say, no, give me, give me the truth. Don't tickle my ears. Don't tell me maybe what I want to hear. You know, I mean, just this last week I heard someone two people talking, the one was talking about a, a really serious situation in their life, and the other person said to them like this, they say, listen, it's just gonna be okay. And they said it in a way as if they are in control of the cosmos, and they, it's, just, it's just gonna be okay. If you just say, it's just gonna be okay. Guys, that's not how it works. I'm not gonna be that kind of person. I'm gonna lovingly tell you the truth of a serious problem that affects us all. So what is this problem? It's this thing called sin, if you've heard of that before. Sin is like the iceberg, and it has hit every one of our souls. And it's just a matter of time before it takes us out. And the sin problem has all started with the way back when, with the first two human beings that God ever made. Help me out, what were their names? Adam and Eve. Okay, we've heard of this, right? Adam and Eve. And what happened was with Adam and Eve is in Genesis 2, here's what God said to them. And the Lord commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. Just one tree they were not allowed to eat of. And then he says, for in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely, what? Die. So... What does it mean that we die? Well, before we elaborate on that, let's just make sure we understand what the sin thing is that's coming out of here that was birthed that day. You see, when Adam and Eve, when they willfully disobeyed creator God and ate of that tree, it's more than just the fact that they ate from that specific tree. That's the issue. It's bigger it's that they knew that God said something and they were like, mm -mm, we're going to do the opposite. You see, sin is rebellion against God being the king of our life. It is saying, no, I'm going to live my life my way, not the way that you tell me to do, God. I'm going to do it my way. That's what sin is. It is rebellion at its root. And God tells us then in the scriptures that in Psalm 51.5, that from the moment we're all conceived, we get inherited this sinful, rebellious nature within our souls. Romans 3 says that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is no one righteous, no, not one. Romans 5 says the same thing, and it says it all throughout Scripture that every one of us has this sin problem. Now, what's the big deal? I mean, seriously, what, what's so big about sin? Well, remember what God said, that if they ate of that tree, if they brought sin into their life and into this world, they would what? They would die. You see, God has told us that death is what comes. You see, like the iceberg, that when it hit and penetrated the Titanic, and it brought death eventually, didn't it? The same way that sin is, has penetrated in and hit every one of our souls, death is coming. Romans 6, 23, God says, for the wages or the consequences or the result of sin is death. Now, what that means is we're all going to die. Now, it's not just physical death. There's actually two deaths, according to God. The first, of course, is physical death, right? That we're all going to die. No one's going to argue with you. You can talk to an atheist. They're going to say we're all going to die. It's 100% stat. You can count on that when you look at anybody in history, in modern day history today. Everybody dies. But here's the thing. No matter how you and I are going to physically die, it could be a car accident. It could be a um, cancer. It could be our heart stops beating, whatever it is. Here's what we know according to God and what he has said in the Bible. All of death actually ultimately comes from the effects of sin in this world. You see, before Adam and Eve ate of that tree, brought sin into the world, it was a perfect world. There was no uh, possibility of an accident harming you nor killing you. There was no uh, mutation of cells causing cancer to kill you. There was no heart just getting tired and old and falling apart. In other words, the second law of thermodynamics did not exist on the body in those days 
everything just kept going healthy and strong. But when sin came, it has caused every one of us to physically die. I mean, how many of us, every time we hear about someone dying, maybe someone close to us, maybe we go to a funeral, and we just, we just have this deep feeling that this is just not right. Death. People dying. That feeling is true. It's not right. It shouldn't be happening. It's not how God originally designed it, but that's one of the deaths that sin has brought. But there's a second death, a spiritual death, that also occurs to us. Because contrary to what evolutionists are going to tell us, where there's no God and we are all just a bag of organs and bones, we are more than that, you and I as humans. We are also a soul. And that soul is going to live forever. But because sin has affected us, our body is going to die, but also our soul is going to die. And what we learn out of the scriptures is that the death of our soul is not something that's just done and done and gone. It is an everlasting, ongoing dying in a place called hell. And I'm sure some of us have heard that. It's not just a cuss word or however you use that, right? It's a place. It's a real place. And so let me share with you well, just one of the passages, many passages in the Bible where God tells us about this place called hell. This is actually talking about the future when it is opened and people are sent there. In Revelation 20, God says to us, he says, And the sea, that's the ocean, will give up the dead and those who are in it. And death in Hades. Now, what is death in Hades? Hades is the, the place where we go now to wait and then people are thrown into hell later. The gates of hell are closed right now, but this is talking about when they'll get open. Those who are in death and Hades, they will give up their dead who are in them. And they were judged, by, judged by who? By God. And each one of them, according to what they had done. And then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the what? The second death. You hear that? The second death, the first death is when people physically die, but the second death is a lake of fire, a.k.a. called hell. And so let me elaborate, summarizing what we learned from the Bible. What is hell? Again, you saw it's a lake of fire. It's a place of gnashing of teeth, ongoing torment. It is eternal con conscience punishment because of our sin. Eternal because it'll never end. It is, uh, you're conscious because you will, you'll know what's going on. You will be uh, punished through all of eternity. That, that's what it is. It's a physical but also now spiritual dying because it's punishment for our rebellious nature of sin against God. Some people jokingly have heard it multiple times. Oh, I'm going to go to hell. I'm going to party with my friends. Guys, that's just foolishness. It's not true. It's not how it's going to be. In fact, you and I should be absolutely freaked out, afraid, horrified by the thought of hell. Jesus himself said that. Jesus said in Matthew 10, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him, that's God, the judge, who can destroy both soul and body in hell Hell is the worst of anything and everything you and I can imagine. And here's the thing. If it's true, we need to talk about it. If it's true, the most loving thing I can do when I talk to anybody is to bring it up. Right? And so hell is something we should be absolutely freaked out about. By the way, hell is not annihilationism. It's not just where we just, uh, we just cease to exist. Because let me ask you this, how much fear on a scale of 10 to 0 would you have of the thought that hell is just, I'm just going to die and cease to exist? You know how much fear I have of that? Zero. I have no fear of just ceasing to exist. But when I think about burning in hell forever and ever and ever, I got massive fear. Do you see? And so don't let people fool you in that. Why would Jesus say to fear hell if it's just to cease to exist? And so let me just summarize again everything we've covered so far. Every one of us, we're born with the sinful nature, like an iceberg that has hit the ship of our souls. And it's just a matter of time. You and I are on borrowed time. We're going to die physically, 
That's the first death. But then we're also going to die and go to hell forevermore because of our rebellious nature against God. And the Bible says there's nothing in and of ourselves that we can do to avoid that. Happy Easter. <laughs> so good news, I'm not done yet. And most of all, God's not done with this story. You guys ever heard of the term good news? The good news of Christianity? You're hearing it right now, okay? But let me say this. We can't appreciate, we can't love, we can't get the good news until we've heard the actual bad news. But the good news is this. Maybe you've heard of this verse before, John 3, 16, but God, amen, right? Let's just, okay, let's just sing. Matt, get up here, okay? <laughs> now, let's finish it. Watch it. We already know the rest of the story, but for those that haven't heard the rest of the story, let me tell you, but God so loved the world, which is you and you and you and me. He loved us so much that what he gave his only son, help me out, salvation, what's his name? Jesus. Jesus. And get this, whoever believes in Jesus should not perish. Guys, that's talking about that second death in hell. If we believe in him, we will not perish, but instead we get eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Let me explain what it means. You see, 2,000 years ago when it says he gave his son, 2,000 years ago, Jesus died of that first physical death on the cross, okay? Just like you and I are going to have to die of first physical death, he did that. Now, did he die physically because he had his own sin and he had to die? No, Jesus was perfect. He was God in the flesh, but he chose to die. Why? Because he chose to die on our behalf for us. So he dies the first physical death, but he didn't stop there. He also died the second spiritual death. He went down to Hades, 1 Peter chapter 3. Why did he go to Hades? Because sin caused him to go there like he would for you and I? No, but because he chose to go to Hades on our behalf. And during those three days while he was in the grave in Hades, here's what happened. Jesus claimed the authority and he got these keys called the keys to death and to Hades and to hell. He got those keys. Jesus refers to that later on in history in Revelation 1. He says, speaking of himself, I am the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. And it doesn't stop there. He didn't just get the keys. He didn't just die physically and spiritually. But three days later, Jesus rose from the dead. Amen. It is fact. It is true. And you and I will never be the same, potentially, because of it. And so let me just say this. I got a picture here, a couple pictures. I've been to that tomb in Israel. I've been there two times. And I'll tell you what, I've been around the world. I, I've been at places that are like all the famous places and all everybody wants to get their pictures at and everything. But I'm telling you, there is no place that got the hair on my body standing up more than standing inside of that tomb. Guys, guess what? It is still empty today because Jesus is alive. Amen? He is our living hope is what the scripture says. And someday, by God's grace, I want to take a bunch of you guys. We're going to go there. We're going to stand there. We're going to worship the Lord there. And you're going to get your hair on your head. Your body's going to stand up. And I'm telling you, it is amazing. Okay? And so when Jesus rose, it, that, when that tomb, when he came walking out of that tomb, he had conquered the power of sin and death over us. Now he has the keys of death in Hades. He's alive. And what that means when you have the keys is you get to choose who goes in there through those gates and who doesn't, who goes in there and stays in there. He has the authority. Death has been defeated in every ounce of the meaning. Now, we could just stop there, but let's go on. Now, just because Jesus has defeated the second death because of his resurrection, it doesn't mean that now all humans are set free from that judgment, that we can be rescued now automatically from the second death and get eternal life. Remember back in John 3, 16, though, listen, it's, it's beautiful, but God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever, though, what do we have to do? We need to believe in Jesus, trust in him and what he did for us. That's how we don't perish. That's how we get eternal life. Jesus himself elaborated on this many times. He said in Mark 1, 15, repent and believe. 
for the kingdom of God is at hand. That's how we get into the kingdom of God. We have to believe and to repent. Repentance is to say, I'm sorry for my rebellion against you and my sin, Jesus, and I surrender my life to live for you as king. You are king. I have been rebelling. Now from now on, I am yours. That's repentance, turning and changing. And so another one, John, Jesus said this in John 11 to Martha. He said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, that's the first death, we're still going to have to die, even Christians, yet shall he live, which means we will not have to die the second death. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And so guys, for us, in order for us to be uh, rescued from the second death and help, we need to believe the facts of everything I've shared so far this morning on Easter Sunday. Do we believe that? Do you believe this? Do you believe that you are born with a sinful, rebellious iceberg that has hit your soul? Do you believe that you're not just going to physically die, but also spiritually die? But do you believe that Jesus loved you so much? He came here 2,000 years ago. He died the death that you and I deserve to die. And that he rose from the dead and he now has the ability to set you free, to forgive you for all your sins so that when you stand before God on your judgment day, that is coming. That he will not say you are a sinner deserving of hell, but he will say, uh, son, he, they gave their life to you. Okay, they're in because of what Jesus did for you on the cross and resurrection, not because of yourself. Do you believe all of that? Awesome. But also here's the key. Have you repented though? You see, James chapter 2, 19 said that demons believe all these kinds of facts. And I'm telling you what, demons are not going to heaven. They're not saved. What's the difference? They believe the facts, but they will not repent. They will not make a conscious decision to say, okay, I believe the facts, but also I am sorry for my rebellion, God. Would you please forgive me? And from this day forward, I'm yours. You are the king of my life. And so I'll just say this, in our society, we, we, the gospel message is out there. People hear different versions, I'll run into people and they'll say, oh, I believe, I believe, I believe. And that's great if you believe the facts I've said so far. But the bigger question is not just have you believed, but when did you repent? When did you bend the knee of your heart at least and say, Jesus, please forgive me. And from this day forward, you are my king. When did we do such a thing of that? It is a decision that we must be able to at least foggily remember in our life. And so I just say, this is the good news. Jesus did everything to set us free. But have you believed and have you repented? If you haven't, it is that easy. And so I encourage you, give your life to Jesus Christ. Now, I love how God poetically describes how it worked when he uh, died on the cross, how he conquered death in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, quoting some Old Testament prophet as well. Um, it is so awesome. It says this, death is swallowed up in victory. I love that, swallowed up. You don't even see it anymore. It's gone because of Jesus raising from the dead and the victory that he had. It says, oh, death, where is your victory? That's like sarcastic making fun of death. You know, death, where's your victory? And then, oh, death, where is your what? Your sting. You see that sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I love, I love the metaphor, the imagery of a sting. Okay? What's the creature that comes to your mind when you think of a sting? Yeah, yeah. I heard different answers, but the one that comes to my mind is a bee. Okay, anybody here by chance uh, like fatally allergic to bees? You have to get that shot thing. Anybody by chance uh, that allergic to bees? Okay, well, by God's grace, nobody here. Or you're just afraid to raise your hand, that's okay. <laughs> but how about this? Maybe, maybe we're not allergic in that sense, ser that serious, but how many of us might as well be fatally allergic to bees the way that we are afraid of bees and, you know, anybody willing to humble and, and say that, that's me, right? You say, yeah, okay, I, I loved it. Uh, I won't say who it was, but someone I love with all my heart. Just last week, I saw them from a little bit of a distance from outside. And I'm not kidding you. I see them going like this and like this, like all over the place. And I'm thinking, are they trying to dance? Because that's really bad, like really bad, you know. But I, 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 what I didn't see was the bee, I guess, that was coming to get them, you know. And... Uh, 
But, but how, how, do, how does the bee thing work, especially with those who are fatally allergic to them? What is it if it stings you that actually kills you? It's the poison with from the bee, right, that gets injected into your body, and then your body reacts, and now you're going to die. It's a poison. So get this. Jesus, when he died, but he rose from the dead. He let sin sting him, not because he deserved it. He let it, though, but he conquered it. He created the Jesus vax. That's what he did. He created a Jesus vax. You see, the reality is all of us, we've all been born stung already. It's already done. We got the poison. We're on borrowed time. But Jesus, when he went, he got, he's created a Jesus vax. He says, if you believe in me and you repent of your sins, I'll give you the vaccine. And yes, you will die the first death, but you will not have to die the second death because of what I've done for you. Amen? Amen. Happy Easter on that one. But you know what I love about this metaphor? It can get you cake a little bit farther. I love this. This is fun. So think about this too. What happens when a bee stings you? What happens to the bee? It dies. Why? Because the stinger gets stuck inside, okay? And then it goes off and it flies away and it has a period of time it's going to live, but then eventually it again is on borrowed time and it will die. Now, are you ready for this? When Jesus also died on the cross for us, it's like he let Satan, who is the bee, sting him, but he made sure he took that, that stinger out of Satan. And Satan ever since knows that he is on borrowed time. Satan knows that hell is coming his way. He's ticked off about it, and he's working really, really hard to try to pull as many human beings down to the pit of hell with himself as he can, but he knows that he is on borrowed time. He is defeated. When Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he defeated sin for us. He defeated the second death for us. Us. He defeated Satan himself for us. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now, guess what? We're still not done. I promise this is the last point, though. Because actually, God's not done. Here's the thing. If you've given your life to Christ, I'm going to talk to those of us that are brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and again, if you're not, man, just give your life to Christ and you're, you're in. That's how it is, okay? But for those of us that, you know, we're saved, we believed, we repented, we're, we're, we should be rejoicing and singing. We're going to do some more singing later. We should do all these things. But is that it? No. Jesus has saved us to send us. Jesus has saved us so we don't sit, but that we serve him. In other words, he, he saves us because now he wants us to live on mission and to work for him. And that's exactly what Paul, who wrote this, get this, this whole chapter, he's excited about the resurrection. And then listen to the very last verse, though. Check it out. Therefore, because of everything Jesus did, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the what? Work. Of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Again, Jesus doesn't save us, so we just sit and wait for eternity to come. Jesus saves us, and we have that to look forward to, but we have some work to get done. What's the work? To get this good news to more and more people through our lives. That's the work. What's the work? To make disciples who will make disciples. What's the work? To obey every command that he has given us. We have a lot of work to do. Not because works save us. Don't let that false gospel get in your head. But we are saved for good works is what Ephesians chapter 2 tells us. We have a lot of work to do, brothers and sisters in Christ. And so, in light of Easter May we not just sing awesome songs, which he deserves every song and everything that we say, but may we also be stirred up once again to say, this week, Jesus, today, Jesus, I want to do the work of you in my life. Show me people to share this good news with that need to hear it. Show me people that you want me to disciple. Help me to get into your word. Help me to do the work that you've created and saved me to do until I die the first death, but then resurrect with you forevermore. Amen to that. Now, here's what's awesome. One of the very first works that Jesus says he wants his saved people to do is to get baptized. Right? He says you believe and you repent, and then you go get baptized. And here's what baptism is. Baptism is a visual acting out of the moment when we believed and repented and we were saved from the second death. 
Okay? And so here it is when you, you're going into the water, that, that, that before you go into the water, it's representing your old self, your unsaved self, the self that was going to die, not just a physical death, but also a spiritual death. But when you die to that and you surrendered your life to Christ, you go under the water, the water represents the, the Holy Spirit, how he cleansed you and forgave you for all of your sins, past, present, and future. And when you come out of the water, it represents how you are a new person, a saved person, a saint, not a sinner in the eyes of God the judge. That's what baptism is. It's acting out what happened that day that you believed and repented. And so, guys, here's what's awesome. We're not done in church service just yet. We're going to continue to worship him by celebrating with some people who are getting baptized today. 